Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Inspire Health podcast. And we are going to continue on with our series on the illusion of free choice, a return to mastering your life. And we are so blessed to have Dr. Christiane Northrup with us today. We've we've had Dr. Northrup on, uh, what is this, maybe our fifth or maybe oh, even okay. our sixth time that we've chatted with Dr. Northrup. Um, we love our conversations with her. She's such a a gift, I think, a total gift to this world and the information that she's brought forward to assist particularly women. I mean, her groundbreaking book, as I've mentioned before, this this Bible here, Women's Bodies, Women's Wisdom. And I say the Bible because that's literally how we considered it going through naturopathic medicine. And she's written a number of other books, The Wisdom of Menopause, Goddesses Never Age, Energy Vampires, and I think probably a few other ones that I'm not putting on that list, but an obstetrician just ahead of her times and mm -hmm. I think has been one of the best voices for women's health that um, our world's seen. So Dr. Northrop, thank you so much for joining us again. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's so fun to see you again because it makes me remember where we all were. <laughs> spoke and how we've all been in this uh, incredible crucible, really, of uh, turning lead into gold. And that's what humanity has been going through. Like we know from everything we've read, whether it is uh, Operation Looking Glass or listening to Cryon say that, you know, if we made it through 2012, humanity was going to make it and that we've now turned on the light, the bright light in your kitchen. So what do you see? All the dirt. <laughs> so, oh, we're seeing some dirt, all right. Um, you know. <laughs> well, and that that's kind of the idea of this this specific series. So for people that are just tuning in, this series is on the illusion of free choice, a return to mastering your own life. And so people have kind of asked, what do you mean by the illusion of free choice? And mm -hmm. we deliberately said that because I want people to just think about that concept of free choice again. Um, and, and all the different things that might influence our ability to, that might be very overt that are in influence our ability to make free choices. And those things that might be a lot more subtle that we're not even aware of that we're making choices within maybe a small boundary of the possibilities that we could actually make choices at. And so if you've been following this series, we're touching on this topic in a lot of different ways. And I specifically wanted to bring in Dr. Northrup to have a conversation around the idea of informed consent, specifically through the ages of medicine. And so if we can kind of look at, you know, where have we been, where are we currently at, and where are we maybe moving towards, and what role do we play in that? So Dr. Northrup, I know that's a big starting point. But um, when we talk about informed consent, because that, that's been a big topic over these past couple of years, what does informed consent mean for people that aren't really aware of it? And, and what does it entail? Okay, well, you know, so as a gynecologic surgeon, then I would do what was called an oper operative consent form. So let's say that you were having a ovarian cyst removal, and we're doing it through the laparoscope. So informed consent tells you, this is the procedure, these are the risks, these are the benefits, and the risks can include death. So you literally tell them everything. Now, you have to look at everything medical is actually a social construction it is a belief system. Western medicine is based on a belief system uh, in cause and effect Newtonian physics. It's not based in quantum mechanics. And as uh, as my good friend, uh, the biology of belief, um, why do I always forget his name? I'll, I'll uh, remember. Bruce Lipton. Name. Yeah, Bruce. And and so uh, you know, Bruce points out that medical science has not changed this Newtonian cause and effect thing in decades. And it's an obsolete way of thinking. So I want to give you a fantastic uh, book title here that happened to be on my desk. Okay, so it's called <laughs> Sane Asylums, The Success of Homeopathy Before Psychiatry Lost Its Mind. <laughs> Isn't that just, it is like, <laughs> it's a perfect example and this guy by the way is um it, this is jerry Cantor, 
a faculty member of the Ontario College of Homeopathic Medicine and owner of Vital uh, Choice, Vital Force Healthcare, a Boston area homeopathy thing. Now he's, you know, obviously was a faculty member in Canada, but <laughs> lives in uh, Dedham, Massachusetts at this point because he had to, you know, get out of there. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you think about it, let, I, I want to talk about homeopathy for a minute and uh, I remember um, there was a guy that taught at Harvard Medical School, Ted Kapchick, who was a doctor of oriental medicine. That was the degree that you got and went to China to study it. And he wrote a book called The Web That Has No Weaver. Yeah, that he was pointed out that, yeah, that the original uh, prospective double blind clinical trial came into existence to disprove homeopathy. That's how they got the double blind prospective controlled clinical trial. And it showed that homeopathy worked. And they couldn't explain it because it's it's in the ethers, it's energetic. How can you, how can the homeopathic remedy be stronger the less that's in it, right? So a, uh, you know, a 400X homeopathic remedy has less in it than the 10X, but it's more powerful. So you see uh, with the left hemisphere, you go, ah, Mm -hmm. ah, you know, how does this even work? So all of medicine, you're having informed consent in a very tiny window of possibility And we've all agreed. Now think of how clever Rockefeller was with the Flexner report and all of that. How clever to systematically go in in the 1910-1912, pay doctors enormous amounts of money to begin to denigrate homeopathy, herbalism, midwives, natural childbirth, osteopathy, nutrition, all of it. So this has been a planned and orchestrated, well orchestrated psyop of what became big pharma because all of the Rockefeller medicines were petroleum based oil. So if you put a basic pharmaceutical medicine, you know, if you heat it up in the oven, it turns into oil. So we have all been under the seriously mass hypnosis that the only thing that could possibly work is a prescription. I need a pill. And I can tell you, and you probably feel this as well, though you're a naturopath, so that's a, you attract a different group. But if you're an MD, the people who come in, what they expect, the sacrament, the sacrament of the doctor-patient relationship is when you push the prescription across the table. That's the real medicine. So we know, for instance, that antibiotics don't do anything for a cold, which is from an adenovirus. So antibiotics do nothing. The average patient in the United States is not satisfied unless you give them an antibiotic, even though we know darn well that antibiotic isn't going to do anything for their cold. Now, what happens though from the placebo effect is that I have um, friends in my life who swear I didn't get over whatever it was until I started that antibiotic. So now we've wrecked the microbiome of most people. Um, we, We do it starting at before birth actually, because now in the United States in the 90s, They began to inject pregnant women with DPT, diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus, and flu shots, all of which contain rather dramatic toxins in the second trimester of pregnancy. How did that happen when when you have been brainwashing women into believing that a glass of wine, a cup of coffee, and a tuna sandwich is not something that they should be doing in pregnancy. But now all of a sudden, I remember the first time because I was out of obstetrics when this came in. And I remember a young woman saying, well, I'm going in for my routine um, 
vaccinations. And I'm thinking routine vaccinations in pregnancy? Are you kidding? Well, that became the thing. So when you talk about informed consent, you're, the, the consent is, okay, systematically, we all agree that this guy who was the head of the department at Harvard Medical School knows a whole lot more than this herbalist who's created a salve with herbs growing in her in her garden. So we know that what she's offering is useless and what he's offering is the way you go. So you can you can hear people say I went to uh, you know my surgeon was trained at Johns Hopkins did a fellowship at whatever and let me tell you something having become board certified in those institutions the stuff that I saw the head of the department doing often made my hair stand on end, but people came from all over because what they were doing was going to the city on the hill. They were going to the great man. And I don't know if you listened to Tucker Carlson do that piece on Anthony Fauci the last two days. It is one of the funniest things I have ever heard. And he talked about the people who worship, it's it's like their their last standing deity to worship, smaller than the Dalai Lama. But they were, and I remember seeing those memes on Facebook in Fauci We Trust or Worship Saint Fauci. And (laughs) we've done what we've done in our culture is we have taught our population to worship everything and give consent to everything that is not the real thing. So I had a partner who went to uh, alcohol rehab way back in the day. And she said, she comes back and she goes, you know what? I realize that I have made everything my higher power, except what is my real higher power. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about the illusion of free choice, it's really the truth. Um, I mean, look at what we've just come through uh, even we know that the law, the law is not, a mandate is not a law. But you went into Whole Foods or whatever it is, and then you had the minions telling you that you had to wear a mask, even though you knew they were dangerous. And we knew that what they were doing was against the law. But we all still did it because the um, the momentum of the PSYOP pulled everyone along except for a few outliers. And, and, you know, the three of us have been outliers for the, uh, for the whole basic PSYOP from day one. And there've been things that we have done. Like if I was going to get on a plane, I needed to wear a mask. Now I never got an N93 or whatever they are duckbill mask. And I had one that, you know, I got off of Etsy that you could breathe through. So I always knew it was a joke. Um, and you know, we're having Matthias Desmond is coming to Maine because he's going to mm-hmm. be interviewed on Tucker Carlson with his new book on how totalitarian, totalitarian governments work. And the beauty of it is that he said all totalitarian regimes fail. Eventually they fail, first of all, because people get tired but most of all, because people like us get stronger and stronger and stronger. And I like to think that our electromagnetic energy field becomes so much more powerful because we've been tested and we've been tested in the crucible for the past two and a half years beyond anything we ever could have imagined because the the rest of the sheep just went along and uh, don't make waves and uh, all the rest of it. We're looking at it saying, this is crazy. Mm-hmm. I, you know, you probably saw that piece by that wonderful German journalist, uh, Gerhard uh, Winooski, who talked, it was a, like a, a missive, a letter to the unvaccinated, saying that we were the the true heroes of the time, that to live through this and resist it, you had more strength than most Green Berets, commandos, or whatever. You know, we're like the heroes of humanity who glow in the dark. Um, and there's something different about us. There's something different. And I, I believe 
that we, um, our souls chose to be here at this time for the turning of the ages. Like I knew that the United States was coming up on a Pluto return. Pluto being, you know, the God of the underworld uh, takes it right down to the studs, death, destruction and all that. And we would go back to uh, 1776 and where this country started. Um, the power of that, we who could have possibly, um, and I knew we were going back to what we have to do is upgrade where the founding fathers were, bring it to the next level. You know, they left out women, they left out, you know, a bunch of stuff. They, you know, destroyed the Native Americans, all of that. So now we've circled back, but we're at a new rung. And there are many of us who can see it. And in the beginning, the majority didn't have a clue. So the people listening to this uh, and us, we are, um, and and you know, and I hate to say this because it's, I don't like the the egoic nature, but we are the chosen ones because we chose ourselves to come down here in the most gangster time you ever could do this on planet Earth. But I swear, the um, spiritual growth that we have done in the past two and a half years probably would have taken two, 3000 lifetimes in the past. You know, we're, we're like, okay. And I met uh, I, the people I've met, I met Danian Brinkley and Danian wrote a book called Saved by the Light. And Danian was hit by lightning when he was uh, just back from being a Marine assassin in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he's died a bunch of times, at least four. And so, when you talk to Daniel, first of all, he's incredibly funny, it, which tells me a lot about God, really. The, the funnier you are, and you know, Huna Flash is a very funny guy too and takes nothing <laughs> seriously. Um, so if you are deadly serious, then that's not of God, in my opinion. It's just not. There, there are things we take. I have a saying that I love. Anything worth taking seriously is worth making fun of. Uh, so Daniel says, well, I know what it is to be dead. And every now and then you're dead. And then you get the message that it's time to go down there, that, you know, that there's some of us son of a bitch is dumb enough to go down there to keep the <laughs> lights on. I'll never forget him saying that. This, you know, we, the dragon riders have to come down and keep the lights on. And I, and I think, you know, that's how it's been. But most people, I will tell you, they do not have free choice. Let me give you an example. So I'm in, you know, a bunch of doctors groups. So someone's asking, you know, and everyone's pretty aware of this particular agenda, but they still have all the old agenda going. Okay. So what shots do my children really need? Which ones are important? And I go, absolutely none of them. Not one not ever. And if you knew the whole story from Suzanne Humphreys of Dissolving Illusions, you would never get another shot in your entire life. And that, uh, so imagine that. that, that's cognitive dissonance right there. But as my friend Robert Fritchie says, cognitive dissonance is the inability to look at how horrible things really are. And and that's the truth. And when I say how horrible things really are, I say it from the from the standpoint of we absolutely have had to go through this. And for how horrible it is, where we're going is beyond phenomenal and wonderful. Heaven on earth. Heaven on earth. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we just talked to um, Paul Selig. His episode will will be out right now. Um, and I mean, for people that aren't familiar with Paul Selig, listen to that episode. It's he's, he's really phenomenal. He's written about 10 books. He channels the guides, but it's, it's, um, it's so poetic. And one of the things he talks about is that specifically we, everybody personally and collectively, everything is, is coming up to see it so that we can see it anew. And then from what he calls from the upper room. So from, from a connection more with true self as opposed to this, this sort of false self that we've 
put so many different constructs and social ideology and belief systems wrapped around that aren't inherently true. But we're going to see all of this stuff come up so that we can see it anew. And then from that, he said very importantly, that then we have to make new decisions based from that upper room. So uh, to me, it's like all the stuff that's coming up. And, and I mean, it's coming up everywhere. So it's coming up globally. We're seeing lots. But individually, you're going to see lots of stuff coming up in our own lives. I mean, we do. Patients I see do. Friends we do. I mean, everybody's kind of, there's a stirring up of the of the sludge that's on the bottom of the pond so that we can all see it and then see it very clearly and then make new choices. And to me, this is this is part of the the illusion of free choice. It's like sometimes you have to see stuff very clearly to then make a very informed decision on the direction you want to go. But if you can't see it, if there's no light on it, then you're still very limited in, in what you're deciding to choose from. Yeah, you know, that's exactly right. And so we're seeing things we never saw before, ever. Now, some of us, have been very aware of, let's say, the vaccine agenda from day one, because I never vaccinated my own kids. Um, and I've known about Rockefeller medicine and all the rest of it. But if you've been brought up to just, you know, this is, well, this is what we do, um, then you won't see it until you see it. The beauty is, and I remember Maharishi Mahishogi from way back, the TM days, he would say, no man can judge another man's consciousness. And so it's completely possible, in fact, it's you can count on it, that you thought, the people you thought were the most conscious, sent their kids to Waldorf school, never had a shot in their life, ate all organic food, did yoga, were the first ones to buy the COVID agenda. Mm -hmm. um, I found this something that I couldn't even have imagined I, I called up uh, someone that I had worked with for years. I wanted to promote something that I had done. And they said to me, well, you have to come out against QAnon, you know, because you're now a QAnon conspirator. It's like, what? First of all, anyone who's done any media training knows that your first thing out the shoot is not to come out against something. It's like, you know, what I learned in media training was, all we remember from Richard Nixon was, I am not a crook. You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, I am not a QAnon conspirator. Like, really, is that all you got? I, I, I've, at this point, okay, I have been labeled, let's see if we get them all, mm -hmm. transphobic, QAnon conspirator, white supremacist, um, anti-vaxxer, of course, you know, the disinformation doesn't. You get to the point where you where you realize those labels are what we do to separate us from each other, to mm -hmm. separate us from our divinity, and it's so convenient. I um, I read a thing. We have a guy in in Maine who follows our main stands up work for medical freedom, and uh, he put on Twitter <laughs> that I had founded a well moneyed Christian cult. It's like wow. I mean, wow. Um, so you get to the point where the worse it gets, the funnier it gets. Because when you're connected, really connected to source, and you're really not trying to pull anything over on anyone, and my message has been consistent for my entire career, nothing has changed, nothing. Mm -hmm. But what happened was people got to the vibratory level that they could handle and then they and then they couldn't go through the the eye of the needle because uh, that would be too much and it was so much easier to find a group to hate um you know this is an epidemic of the unvaccinated to now the cdc saying uh well you know we made a few mistakes like yeah do you think um and and so I found the great culling of the herd, the great culling of the herd, all of those who are on the same page as me and you for my entire career, boom, fell off the truck. Then a bunch of people that I have never had a big following in, which would be the conservative Christians, suddenly hmm. I opened my heart to that group and find 
myself really aligned with the truckers of Canada, with, uh, you know, with the people who um, um, have the guns, um, not for any reason. I mean, I grew up around guns. My mother was a hunter and she got a deer every year at Thanksgiving and then she'd come home. And, and by the way, by the way, if my mother were alive right now and in school, she would have been called a boy and she would have been put on puberty blockers and she probably would have been um, made, uh, made into a, a man from what she was interested in naturally at the age of nine, 10, 11, and 12. And instead she went on to have six children and be happily married. And that's why I'm here. So the agenda that's going on now in a way you can thank them because it's so ridiculous in my profession. I listen to these woke gynecologists from Boston children's talking about doing gender affirming hysterectomies, gender affirming hysterectomies on 12, 13 year olds. This is insanity. And the only way now do those children have informed consent Absolutely not. That was what I was just going to say. It's like, how how do you even, how does someone like that, even at that age, have the capacity to even grasp the, I mean, because informed consent means the full knowledge and understanding that's necessary, that's a necessary factor on whether that individual can give informed consent. How can you even, I mean, I mean, really, how does someone that's that old um, be able to grasp the totality of a decision like that? Well, how does every newborn have informed consent for a circumcision mm -hmm. yeah. or a hepatitis B shot that contains 15 times the allowable amount of aluminum. So the only way that you and I and me can tolerate that is the understanding of soul choice, that, that there's a energetic bond between us and our parents. We choose that portal because that's the only way our soul can learn certain lessons that's the only way i can sleep at night because as we know if we stay in the bermuda triangle of transactional analysis victim perpetrator rescuer victim perpetrator rescuer there's no there's no way out of that one there's no way out of that one you, you'll be unhappy continually so we have to like you said about um selig paul selig go to the upper room yeah you know you you said so many things at the beginning there too that was um very very serendipitous which i often find when we chat with you um i've been recently was reading another book too specifically around bioresonance frequencies same sort of a concept tied in with homeopathy and, and and looking at even um, ideas around the memory and water and, and different aspects of that, really fascinating stuff. And one of the things in the bioresonance book was also looking at how double blind placebo controlled studies were very much used to discredit some of the information tied in with how homeopathy works. Cause it's, there, it needs a, a whole different system of assessment. You just yeah. need to have a very different, because it's not a generic type of a medicine. It's a completely individualized medicine. So you can't operate studies in quite the same way to get the kind of information you're looking for. When you talked about how we still base informed decision around the, I mean, really it's based around this small aspect of the totality of information, you know, this Newtonian sort of world of physics that we yeah. look at, it doesn't take into account this, this larger sort of field of possibilities. What, how does informed decisions, how does informed consent going to have to start to change? And how do you even incorporate more of that stuff? I guess, um, well, from, you know, from where we are now, which seems like it's, so limited and sometimes i would even say it's deliberately not certain information is not put in even when you look at the way statistics are measured in a lot of things they don't mean what we think they mean for the vast majority of stuff but they're still a part of the informed consent so there's there's pieces that are totally missing and then i guess yeah what is it going to start to look like what does real informed consent going to have to look like eventually so people can make uh, a, a better decision for things um, it's going to have to start with a person's first sense, which is their intuitive sense, which we call the sixth sense. 
I need to start with that. So, so let me just say, um, there's certain things in medicine, like uh, the removal of cataracts, let's say almost all orthopedic surgery um, for a broken femur. You know, I uh, do a lot of work with Lee Merritt, orthopedic spine surgeon, and uh, we do a lot of work with the medical, the alternative medical community here in, in Maine. And we all agree, <laughs> when you break your femur, you're going to need someone who knows how to fix that. I don't care how much homeopathy you can wave around. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, so there are certain things, but, but then you look at Joe Dispenza. Okay. So let's remember Joe's whole story, um, you know, becoming supernatural and you are the placebo and here's Joe, this is years ago and he's in a triathlon and the policeman um, waves through a woman in an SUV going 50 miles an hour because the policeman didn't see Joe and Joe's on a bicycle and bam. And so he broke all these vertebral bodies and he was in a striker frame cast and they told him you'll never walk again and we need to fuse your entire spine and all of that. And Joe, a chiropractor, is um, lying there saying, if I can get into the mindset that created my body in the first place, then I can heal this. And so, you know, he did and was on what the bleep do we know? And so he's teaching people how we get back to that part of ourselves that we've been talked out of mm -hmm. starting in childhood. I mean, I think I remember reading um, that there are certain shamanic cultures uh, that it's very easy to heal things because the people have not created blockages to, you know, like, oh, if I put my hands on your eyes, you'll be able to see again. Oh, good. Okay, boom. And it happens. Um, but the more sophisticated, the more left brain the culture becomes, the harder it is to appreciate the magical right hemisphere ability to heal. And so we believe that all that stuff is is um, impossible. There was a book, Jonathan Livingston Seagull way back. Yeah. You know, and he would say, argue for your limitations. And sure enough, they're yours. Well, our entire culture is your limitations. Mm -hmm. And what is healthcare in, in conventional medicine? It's drugs and surgery. And after the age of 50, medicine is your colonoscopy, your mammogram, your uh, lipid profile, your all of that. And what you don't realize in the background is that the American Heart Association keeps lowering the blood pressure levels and keeps lowering the cholesterol levels because they're funded by the company that makes Lipitor and the blood pressure medications. So you don't get all of what's behind that, you know, Pfizer is a serial felon. I mean, I think for uh, Celebrex, they had to pay, or, or whatever it was called, they had to pay the highest damages ever for, you know, 2.3 billion or something. And and that's who we're trusting with this, with this shot. It's like, wow, that's a, um, that is a mindset. You can get to a place of free choice, but everything is pretty much run by fear. Like if you don't go to get your mammogram, this could happen later. Or if you don't, you know, well, you better get it early or you better whatever. Instead of teaching people, you know, uh, you could pay attention to your dreams. A lot of messages come up in that. And there's all kinds of ways that you can partner with the universe you know, you probably know the the book Animal Speak, Ted Andrews, where, um, you know, an animal crosses your path or, you know, you see a, whatever it is and you look it up and what's the medicine of that animal. And you begin to live in concert with constant messages from the universe. And you know what? Everyone knows this. I mean, it, it, regular, even Harvard trained people know this. You know, I had a friend leave my house one night late and the song on her radio going home was james taylor singing i'm a night owl baby sleep all day and beside her on the road was a snowy owl 
God is talking to you all the time, all the time. And so we need to teach the children, the next generation to pay attention all the time to the way God is talking to us. And you can still learn to read and you can still learn to do that. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's interesting because this is exactly what we're reevaluating right now. It's like, mm -hmm. what is really important for our kids to learn? So we have a four-year-old, a six-year-old, and a 17, almost 18-year-old. And I've I've seen and cringed um, through my, my son's schooling because I've just known, I've intuited that it's what he's being offered, what he's being fed uh, with through his schooling is just not necessary. It's just a bunch of hogwash that is actually dampening his creativity and his curiosity, his natural curiosity that all kids come in with. Right. And so this time around, so my son was from a previous marriage and this time around, thankfully, uh, Jason and I are on the same page. And when we sit down and we seriously discuss, well, what is really important? Well, it would be useful to to learn to read and write and, and know a the certain numbers. amount of numeracy and stuff yeah. for sure. But as yeah. far as anything beyond that, I think, you know, it's up to us as a parent to give them the experiences that we feel would be most conducive to supporting the things that they are most excited about because kids come in um, you know, having the three children, you, we can see very clearly that ju they're just inclined and are moved by different things and and they're curious about different fields and have different understandings even within themselves so for us as parents it's really important to really see and know our kids spend enough time with them so that we actually know what our kids are about and what skills and what um, curiosities they're coming in with and to really support that that's really how i see our role and yeah, and as far as, you know, taking them and teaching them or taking them into a regular school system, we're choosing not to do that at all. Um, right. I mean, when we were in Mexico, we went and visited pyramids, we went and, and saw different oceans on different sides. And, you know, that's the best way in our minds as, as far as how to teach kids. And we even um, we're going to be purchasing a few chickens next week, and yeah, they're going to look coop. after the chickens. They're going to look after the chickens. They're going to see where eggs come from. Like that's firsthand experience of of what we feel is really important way to support our children in their learning. Yeah, and you know when kids are naturally so curious, and if they if they uh, there's something they want to research. You've never seen anything like a 9, 10, 11 year old just going for it. And, you know, I'm staying up with a flashlight, reading a book in their bed like, they, you know, because they're following. Apparently, by the way, I uh, heard a story about Nikola Tesla and his father was so worried about him because he was so interested in so much that he would never sleep and he had a trouble eating and all of the rest of it, because he was just, you know, got to get it, you know, got to get this stuff done. And so I think that we, now, if you put your kid in front of iPads and screens, they will become addicted to that. Yeah. And, and I've seen it in my own grand grandchildren. Yeah. Um, so, but what was great is at the beginning, occasionally they could look at a phone now because they're not around it at all. They're not, they're not interested anymore, but we know every hit on that phone on social media is an increase in dopamine. And I've been very blessed that I grew up before that even happened because the people who are on those devices all the time are very different people. They're, mm -hmm. they're very different. They um, communicate through DMs, uh, through apps, through, uh, you know, they don't know how to pick up the phone and actually talk to you, make eye contact. It's a, it, it's a different group. And you have to, especially you with a 17 year old and the younger ones, just guard against that mm -hmm. at all times, because it's so easy to fall into that trap. And they did that on purpose. I remember when Apple gave computers to every kid 
mm-hmm. in our school system here. And we all thought, oh, that's so mm-hmm. progressive. And now I realize that uh, I just heard of a school in Kansas and screens are not allowed. No phones, no nothing. Because the, mm-hmm. the, the good schools are finding how awful this is. A friend just uh, got her son in a school near LA. No phones, no phones. The minute if you're on a phone, that's instant detention. And uh, so I'm thinking, wow, this is exciting. Very exciting. That, yeah. that is really neat. I think you're going to see mm-hmm. a, again, like a a real, well, you're going to see a big division on mm-hmm. some of that too, because you'll get some schools that are full on. They want everything kind of really high tech based and whatnot. And there'll be certain people that are going to be really drawn to that. But there's more and more people that are being drawn towards wanting less and less and less of that and really having their kids. You know, there's there's more nature schools out here now than mm-hmm. I than I remember forest schools. The forest schools. I mean, yes, really, the forest it's like, schools, yes. like the school our kids will go to. It's like part of it is they're gardening. They're looking after chickens. There's still there's still going to be some some sort Minimal. of, <laughs> you know, conventional like learning, learning how to read and write and learning a little bit of numbers and stuff. But but it's 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 based within this idea of being surrounded by outdoors and and different types of skills that I think inherently are, you know, they, they're engaging and they keep you mindful and they're these whole different practices that are just built in, you know, you like gardening is, well, something like gardening. I mean, you know, we, we think it's so simple, but it's like gardening is a really magical um, craft to be able to engage yourself in. I mean, it's we right from early on when our kids were like able to walk they'd come in the garden they not would, even yeah even they'd sit, sit they'd sit yeah. in the dirt and usually eat the dirt and yes worms <laughs> but they would be completely content yeah you know and even Very still calm. our our four-year-old you know is fascinated by flowers I, she's totally like a little flower fairy i mean she will find them and she's just all encompassed with mm-hmm. you know full <laughs> on um, it's just adorable to watch but and the older one the five-year-old or the six-year-old is more animals. enchanted by animals and she wants to know everything about animals wants to know yeah. about their speed and how they live and i mean this is all this is all education so for us to then meet her and to be engaged and to look up information in, in our bookshelf and try to if we don't have it, then to go to a bookstore and look for it. Like this is yeah. all accompanying your child and really. And it's really cool because it's like ours. Like, yeah. like you know, they picked out a book each and one picked out the local flowers and, and flora and the other one picked out local animals. And yes, so yeah. we sat there and they just dived right into them and just wanted to look at all the different things. So so we mentioned this because it's really important for people to to know to have a bit of a, to gain a little bit more confidence within themselves that you don't really need a system outside of yourself outside of your own parental you know motherly and fatherly instincts and intuition and in guiding your children you actually can know how to do it best more mm-hmm. so than, than any system could but yeah, you said that's... something that i think was really important though uh dr northrop you talked earlier around informed consent being really important to start to acknowledge the intuition of the person. Mm. Um, I love that. And I think that's a huge thing that we've, we've kind of been talking about for the last couple of years about really connecting back to that intuitive guidance. But again, a lot of people are disconnected from that intuition. So yeah. from that place, like where, from your perspective, do you start, do people start the process of really being able to start to connect back to that type of guidance so that it's, it's trustworthy again? Because a okay. lot of times I think people have disconnected and then they it's more trustworthy to get the advice from someone outside of them that's in a place of authority as opposed to their own inner guidance. And right. I, I think that's an important piece that we're transitioning around where can we move from an outsir, outside source? Not that they're not there. And part of that could be listen to it, but still run it through your own intuition as well and see if it resonates or not. Right. So... The first thing I would say, again, let's going back to a medical model. Um, You walk in to an office or let's say that you're you've been given a referral. You walk into the office and from the first moment you check in, how do I feel? Is this a healing atmosphere? And if you're an empath, which a lot of people are who listen to us, you are an air purifier and you you walk in and you might well notice that things are not they don't feel so good 
we tend to think something's wrong with us when in fact we're actually just processing the negative energy for everybody else. So we are very susceptible to the authority figure who's so certain, they're just certain. Uh, well, of course, well, nothing could possibly go wrong, like all of that. And our body is screaming, but we override it because anyone who's that certain must be right. Because mm -hmm. if we were that certain, we would be right. We, mm -hmm. If we were that certain um, and had no doubt whatsoever, we, we keep thinking we are like these other people. This brings me to the whole message of dodging energy vampires. So basically 20% of people have a personality disorder along the lines of narcissism, borderline, um, histrionic, and so on. They are the stumbling block for all the empaths because they don't think like we do and they live off what's called narcissistic supply, which is your attention, your money, your sexuality, all of it. And they tend to be in the highest places in our government and in our corporations because they're not like us. They literally don't feel what we feel. So you need to learn about that because chances are very good. You're married to it. Uh, you had a parent who was that way. And so that's your big soul lesson. You'll get to the point where those energy vampires are your biggest teachers because you'll get to the point eventually where you can see them coming. But when in the beginning, you got to go with somebody who sees it because you won't, you'll make a million excuses for them because they're so charismatic. I'll give you an example. Uh, we have a, a young woman who bought 180 acres here. We got people buying farms and all of that sort of thing. And so we have an energy vampire who comes in and, oh, I can bring you um, all of these uh, investors and we can, you know, and she's just painting a picture like, oh my God, and you can be making 30,000 a week and all the rest of it. And they're so certain and they're so skillful at weaving the story that you can just get sucked in because you don't have those skills. So the first thing you need to do is take someone with you. And if it's a medical procedure, always take someone with you, record the interaction so that then you can uh, leave. And, you know, I always would say to people, um, I'm going to tell you what I think, but please get a second opinion. Please, you owe it to yourself. Now, if a doctor is offended by you wanting a second opinion, you have your answer. Mm -hmm. um, I got a phone call just before we started here um, from my nephew who's out in Phoenix. And he said, let me tell you something, auntie. Mm -hmm. If I bring your name up, I know right away where the healer stands. So we went to a doctor, I mean, a dentist. And she goes, he tells her who, you know, who his aunt is. And she goes, oh, she's one of the disinformation doesn't. I love her. I said, okay, <laughs> you got a good dentist right there. <laughs> so, you know, you can, you can kind of tell where, where people are, but if they start to make you feel stupid, mm -hmm. run, mm -hmm. then you run. And eventually with authority figures, you get to where you can trust. Oh, I like, I like this person. I'm that way with doctors. I'm very good with um, telling who the good surgeons and the good homeopaths and the good, I just feel it. I know I'll tell you where, what has been um, a parallel construction where I have really had to step up to the plate. And that is with financial advisors, mm -hmm. um, you know, because I wanted to get some of my pension plan into gold and silver. Mm -hmm. And it is clear that my uh, woman who I have adored forever works with a big company and they get their, um, you know, they're not a kickback, but you know, percentage from selling you this certain kind of stock. And we're moving into a different financial system. And I realized I finally just had to say, I have to do this so I can sleep at night. I, I, you know, I know that you are dead set against this, but I've read the creature from Jekyll Island and I know what's going on with the money, you know, system, because I've asked her for years about the Federal Reserve. 
And she's like, well, you know, it's just something we have to live with. It's like, no, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of like right at this very now moment, I haven't been to the dentist for two and a half years. I usually went every six months. I'm not going to go in there and wear a mask. I don't like the fact that my holistic dental office, which I have loved for decades, mm -hmm. drank the Kool-Aid. So I'm between there. But guess what? With oil pulling and all the rest of it, I'm not having any trouble. And now I, I hear they're insisting on x-rays. It's like, I don't think so. I don't think so. But, you know, I trust myself. And here's the other thing. The crooks of all of it, all of it is this. Those of us who are going to do well in the world we're building are the ones who are willing to take 100% responsibility for what happens to us. And even if you didn't see it coming, you say, well, there must have been something in my energy field that drew that to me. That doesn't mean that you're to blame. It means that you are responsible to a situation. It is the most powerful thing you can do as just decide, all right, I'm going to take 100% responsibility for my life and for whatever happens. And I will tell you, I'm going to give you a real grounded example. Okay. So I knew that I had to declutter my, my home. And I knew there were too many piles of paper and I got two and a half years of, oh my God, here's the smoking gun of, you know, and I've got the data that they keep disappearing off the internet and I, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I went home to my childhood home and it was the first time I'd ever been there without my mother alive. She died at age 95 last September. Mm -hmm. And so our job was to go through some of her things. And suddenly the whole thing is gets into perspective. The family pictures, the this, the that, what you want. You want your parents to keep your stuff the way it's always been so you can go back and, and visit it, but you don't actually want it, but you want them to have it around so that, you know, this is my childhood kind of thing. When we're suddenly going through boxes and all of that stuff, my mortality hit me between the eyes and I came home and I said, okay, I don't think that I need all of this stuff. Mm. And suddenly something shifted in me. Plus I, I listened to a Ted talk where the woman said, clutter is often the result of not making a decision. Hmm. so i want to give you a practical tool so you know i i love these um pound pendulums it's from poundjewelry.com it's a mother-daughter group in uh, st louis i just adore their stuff so um i always have one of these with me so i was going around <laughs> to my books and i have a massive library books whatever put my hand on it and then for me uh yes is this way and show me a no, and no is the other way. So I don't get caught in my intellect. And if you do it when you're a little tired, then you just, you know, you're just going through yes, no, yes, no, boom, and then get it out of there. Mm -hmm. What a difference. I have to tell you, I walk in my house and the difference is amazing. The excuse, let me be very clear on the excuse that I was using was okay. Right now, I'm doing everything in my power to uplift and save a percentage of the population because where they're going into the matrix and all that is kind of too horrible to think about. And I'm going to work with the humanity that's still left. You know, that's why I'm doing the, you know, the dating site for those who still have native DNA and don't have carbon nanotubules throughout their system. And But that was like, you know, my excuse and then I realized that's just another excuse. <laughs> so I get it done. <laughs> we, we literally just went through and did the same thing. It was, it was actually after one of the Oracle Girl um, reboots. Oh, we've been, we've been doing we've it been, since, well, since moving. We've moved so much Three since years. Well, that helps. years ago. Uh, yeah, for sure. And it was just yeah. purging, purging. And then we just, we've got a huge library too. And we just went through again and just emptied out another big 
crate of box uh, of books again. And um, I mean, and, it, it and just feels all of our all of our yearbooks. You know, the yearbooks that you keep from childhood. It's like there's still this attachment to the way things were, or the way you were perceived, even as a child, as a teenager, and so on. And so I feel like yeah, listening to Oracle Girls um, recording just recently. It's, it's a good time to to just let go because these things are all links and like cobwebs and it's time yeah. to just let it go. Well, and the idea of having your your energy, more and more of your energy being less tethered to anything that even we're not even conscious of mm -hmm. and just to have it back so that then I, I think we do step into making better decisions. You know, you, you talked about with your dentist and even having to do your own sort of taking responsibility for your own health. This, this was something that was really obvious to us when we went to Mexico. So when we yeah. were there, we kind of became a bit more of like mm -hmm. a, of a hub for whenever somebody had yes. an ear infection or a cold or a bee bite Anything. or whatever it might've been, because we were kind of the people there and we bring a pretty extensive, um, natural travel first aid kit with us so mm -hmm. we started talking we're like you know this is really interesting because we are also meeting so many people that were like getting up and going somewhere else or traveling and there's a lot of unknowns in that and we thought it's incredibly important for parents to start to learn how to actually manage a lot of stuff that you can manage for your family from a first aid perspective without the worry that you need to go to the doctor and it's not to say that that's not an option when it's available but sometimes it's not going to be available and there's so many things that you can do on your own you just don't they just don't know the skills yet so we literally came home and i always just hammered through and wrote up uh it's probably going to be a little over a hundred page ebook on travel first aid for natural travel first aid for the families and breaking down nice. major conditions and then even pulling together these are some of the key things that we use that's in our travel kit so that you can manage what how do you actually manage a fever how do what are some of the things you can do for a cold and a flu what do you do for um bug bites and for scrapes and you know from a natural perspective and what i find is that when parents actually do that and they see it through and they see yeah. that they were able to do it on their own. I mean, it's, it's empowering. Mm -hmm. And then I think from that, that extrapolates out into many different decisions they start to make. Then all of a sudden it's like, huh, you know, I yeah. think it opens up the door for how do I want my child to be educated? What kind of other decisions do I want to make? But it, it, it gives that sort of, um, do I want to live here or don't I, do I yeah. want to keep this job or don't I, it, it really is neat because it's like, as soon as they, I mean, it's like, I find like, like with a fever, fevers can be a scary thing for parents to deal with, with their kids, part, partly because we've been so indoctrined that fevers yeah. are such a yeah. scary thing. Right. And, and so, you know, know kind of your, have some information. So you kind of know more of the whole story and what you can do to sort of manage that. And what I find is that when, when parents work with their kids and they know how to do it, you know, like fortunately for us, we've never had to suppress a fever in our kids ever. Right. Our kids, right. I think, have a really robust immune system because they've been able to um, they've been able to build it on their own just by yeah. supporting these things. And and partly what also people don't realize is that when we let them kind of move through certain things and support them properly, know 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 where the limits are on stuff. But how do you support it? And most of the time, you can support things. It's not that hard for most things, right? Um, and all of a sudden, it's like when parents go through that process, I feel like they just it's like they step into a, a new level of confidence on things. So anyways, that's in the process of getting completed up and should be out soon. But um, that was just something for us when we were there, like, that's really important. And I think there's going to be more and more things like that for how do we take that responsibility back and, and what can we do on our own? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that is true about a lot of doctors, families, as you know, and I come from a medical family and because they know what's going on, you just never go to the doctor. I remember my kids saying to me, will we ever go to the doctor? I said, I hope not. I mean, it, you don't need to, it, you know, the medical types know what, and I remember being um, a medical student at Dartmouth and I did a rotation in Plainfield, Vermont in a family practice office. And I'll never forget it. I thought my mother could handle 95% of what walked in here. What are these people doing here? Mm -hmm. 
because yeah. they've been trained that they can't possibly know. Yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm really excited about that piece of things of people taking responsibility back. And I mean, we're seeing it right now with different groups that are being created within our local community, like yes. based on here's how to support you and how to garden. Here's how to support you. If you want to learn how to hunt, here's how to, how to build, how to build things. I, I'm, I think it's really cool that there's all these opportunities coming up for us to be able to start to, um, you know, kind of relearn self-reliant. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I mean, I think about the same as that you had mentioned, a lot of my patients, they would tell me, I, I might be saying certain things like, gosh, my, you know, my grandma used to talk about <laughs> stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, cause they knew like, and they had to, because it was sort of more there. They had to know how to look after themselves and their families. And, you know, yeah, we, right. we spoke earlier about what is it going to take or how do we make the transition from relying more on the intuition? I feel like either we make a conscious decision to go about things and listen more to the inner voice, or we come across certain circumstances and situations where we, we are hit with something that was drastic or um, for example, just going back to when my son, when he was born, I was in my early to mid 20s. That's the time that I was going in for uh, the appointments with the pediatrician. And really, the only reason the pediatrician sets you up for these regular appointments is sure, they check their weight, check their height, but really, it's to go in for the inoculations. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. That's, and, yeah. And at the time, you know, I was, I was the first time I took him in as an infant and that was done. And he, he felt a little feverish to me afterward. And yes, I heard that those are the side effects. The second time, same thing. And I started to regularly, he, I started to realize as a mom that every time I would go in for the appointment, following that he would have the fever, he would get um, every time ear infections, and then I would have to take him back in for the inf ear infection, and then it would be going to put him on antibiotics. And this became a regular thing. And I just, I realized as, as a parent, I was like, this didn't feel right. And I asked yeah. the pediatrician, I said, are you sure there's, there's no side effects to these things long-term or short-term? And like you said, very confidently, he said, no, absolutely not. These things go through a series of studies and they're absolutely safe. And I believed him until my son was probably three and a half. And I just said, that's it. I'm done. Like I, I've had it enough with the ear infection. I've, I've had enough with not feeling like the doctor is actually being truthful with me. And then sure enough, I started to look into it on my own and do my own research. And at that time, none of my friends were had any children as yet. And so I was on my own needing to do the research. And sure enough, I, I started to realize these are not 100% risk free. And, um, and, I, and I stopped at that point. And so these are the things I feel like even now what we're coming up against, there's been lots of documentaries, there's been, you know, you have spoken adamantly since the beginning, and there's been so many others who are now speaking up as well, there's more and more information coming forth about the repercussions of, of the certain choices that many have made these past two years. And so people are going to see it firsthand. There's been friends who are, have also spoken up about, you know, getting the, the third shot for their teenager who has had, who now has heart problems. So these things are going to come more and more to the surface, unfortunately, and are going to cause us to kind of step back and say, pause, let's re- yeah. Let's reevaluate all of this. And you know what? I realized that when we, when this whole thing started and I basically, you know, did a webinar with Polly Toomey from Vaxxed and, you know, what do you think this shot is? And I said, it's a murder weapon. And, you know, then I was ripped in the, in the mainstream media. Um, and I realized that where I was and where most people were, what it was just a bridge too far because I'd been building faith and I'd had the studies and I worked with the American Holistic Medical Association for years. And well, it basically started when I had, you know, two members of my family sign out of the hospital against medical advice before I went to med school. So they'd be dead, you know, if, if uh, they had stayed. So I was pretty radicalized even before med school. And uh, so most people don't have, they don't have that and yet. No, this is what we do. You know, we go to the doctor, we do our routine annual physical, and it really doesn't matter. And I, you know, I want people to know this, especially 
those of you who have family members who you're trying to convince and you're trying to wake them up. And I want you to know you can stop now. Don't bother. Just love them Mm -hmm. from afar. Usually you have to do it from afar because I want you to be kind to yourself. Your heart can't take it. My heart can't take it. I'll give you a really example of this. One of my daughters went down to New York City and she went to see the Broadway show Hamilton, which she said is absolutely wonderful. My heart can't take it to go to New York City and watch a whole group of beautiful actors and actresses Mm -hmm. and singers and know that every single one of them Mm -hmm. had to consent to what was injected into their bodies in order to follow their dream. Because for me, where I am, if someone had told me that I needed this, or if someone, if a daughter-in-law had told me, you can't see the grandkids until you've had this, I have within me uh, a sovereignty that comes roaring to the surface so hugely that I just can't be around that. I couldn't enjoy Hamilton knowing that every single one of those people is likely to have increased risk of cancer, neurologic problems, infertility. And and then, by the way, because my daughter was involved in um, the arts in New York City, it wasn't just one shot. They all needed not only the two shots, but now you need your booster and your next booster. And it's like, they have made a pact with the devil. And I can't watch it. It, I, it, it. I just can't. Now, some of you can. And that's okay with me. I mean, but when people say to me, well, I had to take it. I didn't have a choice. It's bullshit. Mm-hmm. Of course you had a choice. I, I, I look everywhere. I don't know if you got this going in Canada right now, but everywhere you go, help wanted, help wanted, help wanted, help wanted. We have a thing now in our state that uh, all these people are on this particular program. You can only work 19 hours a week. And after that, if you work longer than that, you lose all your benefits. So we have so many places that they don't have the staff to work. Um, I just, I guess because I knew from the beginning what this thing was, how could you ever do that and then and then say you didn't have a choice? You did have a choice. You always had a choice. Now, when you just didn't know, that's quite that's quite different. But when you okay, so I want to talk about a particular dilemma. All right. That's when you kind of knew you shouldn't do it, but you did it anyway. Those are the ones where you get out the flail and you beat yourself up for it. If you really absolutely didn't know, if you just did not know, and you didn't even have the still small voice, you're kind of innocent then. And that would be a two-year-old who's, uh, this just happened in our community. One of our, one of our guys who had a son with this woman, she promised him she would never get him inoculated. And uh, she just did it. Uh, You know, a a beautiful 11-year-old boy. The people don't realize the gravity of this. This is not, okay, you got a polio shot, even though, for the record, everyone who's currently getting polio got it from the inoculation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so the more you know, but and then, but we can't get we a lot of the people in this field have been screaming at the top of their lungs, you know, just, and so that's not a fun life. That's in the, that's the rescuer thing. You're so into rescuing that you become a perpetrator. Like no one wants you to have, to have you around. That's no fun. You know, that's no fun. So the people I've met like you folks and all the people from the Clay Clark reawaken America and Kevin Jenkins and all my buddies and all of that, we're, a group that's really fun to be around. Um, Huna Flash, that whole group, uh, Burning Mass down in Cozumel, that was a great group of people. Um, so, you know, we're we're just a very certain vibration, very specific vibration, and that's who I ch- that's who I know is going to be building the parallel economy, the new earth, all the rest of it. 
and it's really very exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Christiane, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, any last words as far as for moving forward for where people are now as far as moving forward and being able to step back into that place of being able to really make choices from a place of, of I think, self-awareness, more self-awareness, um, stepping back into that mastering their own life. Any final words for people before we finish up? <laughs> yes. If you have a question, just ask God, wait for the answer. So simple. <laughs> so simple. <laughs> And you know, it's really interesting because right at the beginning of um, of this pandemic, the strong message that was coming through was look for the spiritual context. Like it was a voice that was just amplifying more and more when I was looking around at everything and everything seemed untrue, off access. It was that voice of look for the spiritual context. And more and more it's, and, and this is why we started to incorporate a lot more of the metaphysical perspective, the spiritual aspect of understanding reality, because it's really imperative. If we're kind of trying to look at things from the smaller aspect of us that is so disconnected from source, um, then we're simply just rearranging things in the same guck, muck and mess that we've always seen it, seen it in. But, um, it's even having, having that understanding, you know, Guy Needler will come on and RJ Spina will come on and Paul Selig will be aired here as well. And your perspective of the spiritual aspect, all are saying the same thing in as we are actually at the lowest of the low frequencies. There yeah. is no hell. This is this is where we're at. We're at rock bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, knowing that, though, um, Dr. Northrup, it is exciting because we've kind of climatized <laughs> to this to this lowest frequency that we found ourselves in. And to know that, you know, all these things are rising to the surface for us to see them very clearly so that we can make different choices in order to raise our frequency we're going up from here. It's going to be, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be raising our vibration and everything is going to become more beautiful. Not until we take care of the mess that we're currently in, but this is a progression that we're currently in in humanity's mm -hmm. evolution. And that's, that is really exciting. Yeah. Well, it's because it, because then we see it differently, mm -hmm. right? It's not that the world completely changes, but we see the world differently. And from our perspective on seeing it, we will choose differently yeah and then then we make the world new right that's right yeah absolutely thank yeah. you so much dr, dr. Northrup. Northrup, thank you so, you so much, much. yeah thank oh, it's you. so wonderful seeing you good to see you i think